Hi everyone, I'm on Sour Vance. I'm an interventional radiologist at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm happy to share this presentation on the biomechanics of the FEMPOP segments and then the various stent designs available to address this challenging landscape. So a quick outline, we'll start with some of the complex biomechanical issues associated with the FEMPOP territory. From there, we'll break down some of the different stent designs, and then finally, we'll end with the available scaffold and some of the data to back them. So we'll start off with this picturesque drawing of the femopopteal artery here. Perfect 90 degree reflection of the knee, associated perfect 90 degree reflection of the popteal artery right at the knee joint. In an ideal world, this masterpiece would be accurate, depicting only one point of bending directly across the joint that we really have to worry about. Unfortunately, a single plane of flexion of the popliteal artery is just not the reality. There are actually a combination of multiplanar forces throughout the leg, and even this is a bit of a simplification, but there are four main forces discussed, axial compression, radial compression, bending, and torsion. So although this depiction is slightly more accurate, still not the best. So a group out of University of Nebraska has done a series of fascinating studies on the topic. I love to show these studies because they really emphasize the complexity of lower limb arterial forces. So for this one, they took 28 lightly embalmed limbs from 14 cadavers. They accessed the external iliac artery in each and perk exited the tibial artery in the distal calf, achieving false access. They then deployed a string of these precise intraarterial markers throughout the SFA and pop, and with inflow and outflow sheaths, circulated a warm radiopaque solution. They then performed multiple CTs with 3D recons of each extremity in multiple specific degrees of flexion, representing the physical positions of standing, walking, sitting, and gardening. They then performed a variety of calculations based on the markers. So on screen right, A represents normal position, B represents markers for shortening or axial compression, D represents twisting with tracking of a single asymmetric limb on each marker, and finally C represents bending. So for this, they marked the central string on the markers as a center line and took the radius from the center to calculate the bending. They then assigned these spheres on the diagram to represent different amounts of bending. Essentially, the smaller the sphere, the more severe the bending. As we can see on screen left, the most severe points were at the adductor hiatus, where there was commonly two bends in an S configuration, and second right across the knee joint. Interesting to note, there were also a couple points of mild, moderate bending at the proximal SFA, as well as some more severe bending at the distal pop and TP trunk. They then took it a step further with this study in 2021. They took 125 subjects and went on to excise and evaluate the pathology of these segments. Note the same severe bending at the adductor hiatus and across the knee joint on the left. On the right is an extracted fempop segment of a 79-year-old male. The aforementioned points correlated with more severe atherosclerotic pathology on the gross specimens as well. So you know that the biomechanics are quite complex at baseline in the FEMPOP segments. Of course, there is normal anatomic variation between patients. Even if you try to understand all the changes, you had a single stent. Now you've changed the biomechanics completely of the stented segment, as well as of the adjacent unstented proximal and distal segments. Even more complicated, each type of stent affects all these segments uniquely. So essentially, each single scaffold produces a new, unique biomechanical landscape in each individual patient. This is a patient that was referred in with a recurrent rest pain. He has an old silver PTX extent across the distal SFA with some instant stenosis. There's a superior stent across the knee joint on screen right. Note where it starts and ends. Then single vessel runoff via the PT and a stent in the TP trunk as well. If I'm treating these segments, I have a low threshold to perform these bent knee angiograms to really evaluate the stented and adjacent unstented segments. You can appreciate the significant bending just proximal to the superior stent above the actual knee joint. The superior stent actually looks minimally deformed. So on screen left, there's a magnified shot showing the superior to be fairly straight. Of course, one view is no view, so on screen right, an oblique view of the same. Now you can appreciate not just the 90 degree angle above the superior, but also a second right angle of the superior itself in a different plane. 
The step reveals the deformation better than the wire given the wire bias here. The same oblique and flexed view on the screen left. Here let's focus on the actual shortening between the superior stent and the adjacent TP trunk balloon expandable stent here. Screen right, now with the limb extended again, lengthening of the unstented gap. Of course these changes are different in different obliquities as well, but there's always a degree of axial compression between segments that we have to remember. So these are just completion images post-intervention. Decision was made in this patient to perform atherectomy with drug coated balloon angioplasty. But no additional stent was placed. All right, moving on. Now that we understand the complex biomechanics, let's move on to the stent designs. Let's start with a little bit of history. So back in 64, it was Daughter and Judkins that actually presented the first angioplasty. This was actually done with the serial dilators. In 69, Daughter described stent design. He actually used a stainless steel wrap to create the first coiled stent. But it wasn't until 78 when the proper first balloon angioplasty was done by Grantzig. And then in 86, Poole and Sigward actually did the first coronary stent. There's so many different types of stents with so many nuances for various pathologies, various indications, and various advantages and disadvantages of each type. Key stent characteristics including varying flexibility, radial force, and fatigue tolerance. The geometric parameters are often the fundamental details that separate different stents. These include strut length, free cell area, strut cross section, strut angle, as well as different types of stent links. A very simplistic dichotomy of stent types is open cell versus closed cell, each possessing their unique advantages and disadvantages. So closed cell, typically the cells are equal with smaller free cell surface area. Radial force in these stents is more evenly distributed. These are typically more rigid stents. Open cell, on the other hand, there's higher free cell surface area. This makes them more flexible and they conform better in tortuous anatomy. The open cells do make them susceptible to gator backing, which I'll come back to in a few slides. Realistically, the majority of stents nowadays are one of many variations of an open cell design. So beyond open or closed cell, the struts can have varying designs that will result in different mechanical behaviors. Strut options can include varying strut lengths, free cell areas, shapes of cross sections, and as well as strut angles. Different strut designs are also related to the many different types of stent links. These links can for varying degrees of flexibility and bending stiffness. In general, the more symmetric the links, the more flexible the stent will be. So for years, a variety of straight laser cut night and all stents were all we had. Unfortunately, the repetitive multi-dimensional as well as multi-planar forces in the FEMPOP segments that we discussed that resulted in pretty significant biomechanical incompatibility with these devices. This resulted in really two main issues. The repetitive trauma resulted in stent fatigue and eventually stent fracture in many cases. And second, there was associated additional arterial stress and damage, not only to the underlying stented vessel, but interestingly to the adjacent unstented vessel as well. And of course, this combination resulted in all of the things we don't want. Restenosis, reduced patency, thrombosis of all of these segments. This study from 2008 looked at the issues with fractures. They took six of the common straight laser cut stents available at the time and performed similar cadaveric studies. They then performed fatigue testing with a separate bending deformation apparatus and axial deformation apparatus, screen left and right respectively here. They then cycled each of the six stents 10 million times to see which ones actually made it out. So they found that the bending deformation was much more traumatic to the stents than the actual trauma was. And in particular, they found 100% of the Luminex, Protégé, and Smart stents fractured with the bending, while Life Stent and Absolute Stent actually withstood the bending better. All 
Another study from the Nebraska group looked at the issue of scaffolds affecting not only the stented vessel, but the adjacent vessel segments as well. They evaluated these seven separate stents, deployed them in cadavers, and then they evaluated the stented and adjacent stented, unscented segments. So I won't list them all, but different combinations of the stents cause varying degrees of foreshortening, bending, and twisting in the stented segment, as well as proximal and distal to the stented segments. So on screen right, they also pinched each of these stents 180 degrees on the bench and evaluated for kinking and luminal changes. As you can see, the smart stent almost completely pinched off, and the Absolute Pro had this gator back deformation, which raised concerns of increased trauma to the underlying vessel here with each flexion movement, whereas the Supera stent performed quite well in these tests. So with that, we'll finish up with the available stents for the FemPop segments. Drug coded or drug eluding stents have set the bar for scaffolds in the FemPop territory. Zilva PTX is an open cell they describe as a Z cell stent. The bottom is a mag picture of that strut geometry. It's polymer free, paclitaxel coated with a drug dose of about three microgram per millimeter. So for years, this was the only drug stent available on the market. Five-year data showed 72.4% primary patency. This really set the new standard for FemPop lesions that required a scaffold. Now we have the alluvia stent as well. The novel aspect is that this is a polymer coated and paclitox eluding rather than just coated stent. This allowed for a much lower drug dose of only 0.167 microgram per millimeter. They did a head-to-head -head trial with the Zilver PTX showing improved one-year primary patency of 92 versus 82 as well as better two-year primary patency of 83 versus 71. Even in the subgroup analysis, two-year primary patency was maintained in the high 70s and 80s. Again, the geometry is a variation of open cell design here. Of note, the five-year data on Alluvia Imperial RCT was released earlier. Five-year CDTLR results for the Alluvia and Zilver PTX were similar at about 74.8 and 71.4, as were the primary patency rates for both at five years. It seemed like once you look into the data at about the three-year mark, the Alluvia benefits start to fall off, and the drug and polymer coating seemed to essentially be a little bit of a wash beyond that. The Alluvia groups did avoid intervention for about five and a half months longer through three years, and for three months up to five years follow-up. There's also data for self-expanding stent grafts in the FemPOP segments. The unique aspect of the Viabon is their propane heparin bioactive surface to fight early thrombosis. The Viper studies show that the Viabon stents have 73% primary patency, which is a bit subpar when comparing to the newer drug eluding stents just mentioned. So being a stent graft, it does come with the caveat of sacrificing collateral as long as passed, so that should be kept in mind when you're using these devices. I do utilize these in certain situations, sometimes in patients with repetitive short-term short ISR, as well as rethrombosis, sometimes to reline fractured stents, certain aneurysms, and occasionally in ruptures. We should just know the data and keep it in our toolbox. So we'll finish up with some of the newer technology available for these segments. First, the Supera stent by Abbott. Rather than a laser cut tube, it's made up of interwoven or superwoven nitinol wires. This configuration allows high flexibility and significant fracture resistance. If deployed in an overpack conformation, it can provide high compression resistance, geared for the high levels of calcium commonly encountered in certain segments of the FemPOP. And if deployed with a one-to-one -one sizing, there's a low chronic outward force, resulting in less chronic trauma to the stented vessel as well. But it is key not to oversize these stents. So through the initial superb study and subsequent registries, there were zero fractures at one year. This chart from the Abbott website quotes an impressive 91% one-year patency and 94% three-year freedom from TLR, sitting nicely at the top of this table against marked competitors, including the two drug eluding stents. The key asterisk here is that this is the nominal deployment, defined as plus or minus 10% of the labeled stent length. Unfortunately, the deployment mechanism is a little bit more complex than the simple pin and pull or crank wheel mechanisms available. In this study, 
If you look at the fine print, this resulted in only 36% of the stents actually being deployed nominally. Although not in the 90s, the three-year data from the superb study was still pretty impressive. 86% primary patency at one year, and 89, 84, and 82 freedom from TLR at 12, 24, and 36 months, respectively. I'll briefly touch upon the deployment here. So you can either overpack or underpack the stent as you deploy it. On the left is the ideal packing. The diamond should be twice as wide than tall. In the middle, what they call not optimal. The diamonds are compressed horizontally, resulting in a shorter stent overall. And on the right, suboptimal. You get vertically elongated diamonds, resulting in an elongated stent. So ideal is ideal, but you should err on the side of compressed as the elongated implants do result in reduced patency rates. The last then I'll discuss is the Biomimics 3D by Varian. It's a laser cut night and all stent, but it has a unique 3D helical center line. It also has the benefit of a straightforward pin and pull deployment mechanism. So what does the helical geometry do? As discussed, straight night and all stents do not allow for physiologic compensation with the knee flexion and result in deformation proximal and distal to the stent. The 3D design allows it to be a little bit more flexible and essentially builds a little bit of a crumple zone in the stented segment. This allows for less transmission of forces and associated buckling and kinking of the adjacent unstented segments. It also allows for more movement of the stented segment, allowing for more dynamic artery, ends up resulting in less fractures. In addition, the non-planar curvature promotes swirling blood flow, resulting in increased wall shear stress. Studies have shown that increased wall shear stress reduces thrombus formation and inflammation, as well as smooth muscle activation and neomintimal hyperplasia. This combination provides not only the fracture-resistant benefits, but adds reduced ISR as well, helping it compete with some of the drug-looting-based devices as well. Their Mimics RCT trial at 24 months revealed 72% primary patency and 91% freedom from TLR. Their European registry showed 75% freedom from TLR at 24 months, as well as 91% patency at one year and 83% at two years. With their unique wall shear stress benefits, the results are also comparable to not only Supera, but also the aforementioned drug eluding scaffolds, of course, without any of the drug concerns. So in summary, the FEMPOP segments are a complex space for PAD. We should be aware of the complex biomechanics that play a role in these areas. Most stents these days are variations of the original open cell designs, including the available drug eluding scaffolds. Stentcraft can also play a role in FEMPOP disease, but they do come with the caveats of primary patency in the 70s and coverage of branches that comes with that. Fortunately, we have some specialty devices to address at least some of these biomechanical hostile areas as well.